All right, welcome to lab four on the ANOVA. There's a whole bunch of chapters on ANOVA in the ABDI textbook. We're basically looking at chapters seven and eight right now. If you want another version of a textbook to read, uh, check out the chapter on ANOVA here from my undergraduate stats textbook. Um, let's get into it. So we've got a bunch of things to do today. Just looking at this overview, we're going to look at doing the ANOVA by hand in R. This is not how you would normally do it. We'll also look at how to use the AOV function just to do everything really quick. And uh, throughout this lab and the next few labs, we're going to use R to help us understand the pieces of ANOVA, to try to develop some of our conceptual understanding of how this works. So ANOVA stands for the Analysis of Variance. It's a technique we can use um, for experimental designs where we have uh, some independent variable that we're manipulating and we want to find out if that manipulation causes some change in the thing we're measuring. Now this is a general tool. It can be used for designs where there's only two levels. Previously we've used a t-test for that but it's more flexible than a t-test in the sense that we can use the ANOVA for designs with multiple, more than two in, um, levels of an independent variable. And here you might have the same question. It's like, great, I've got some independent variable, got these different groups, and I want to know if the thing I'm measuring changes as a function of the different groups. Uh, we'll see today, uh, we've talked about it in the lecture, one of your generalization assignments is to show that the ANOVA and t-test produce the same results when you only have two groups. So it's an extension really of the t-test concept. But let's, uh, before we get into R, let's just think about this big question we have in experimental designs. That is, did your manipulation cause some change in your measurement? Specifically, we'll be focusing on changes in means. So I've got means represented by the bars, individual data points represented by the these little dots. And if you have some experiment like this one with four different levels, you know, if your manipulation does cause change, you'd expect the bars not to be the same like this. There are some differences here. So maybe this would be evidence that your manipulation did something. Okay. Just like in a t-test situation, these kinds of differences can occur by chance. So we do have to consider the role of chance when we are doing our analysis. So I've got some pictures here just to illustrate some of the thinking that's going into the ANOVA logic. So let's consider this kind of data that you might find where you know, we've got some different data points here, we've got some different means. How would the null hypothesis explain all of this? The idea is that all of the data points are coming from the very same population, the same mean and standard and variance. Right? And what you're just doing is you're just randomly putting some numbers into group A, B, C, and D. It'd be like sampling these numbers four different times. Um, you could do that. You could take some numbers from here, put them in A, put the, take some more numbers from here, put them in B and C and D. And that wouldn't be an experiment. That'd just be sampling some numbers from the same distribution four times. And if you did that, you'd basically expect that... Uh, the means of the samples would approximate the mean of the population. Uh, in other words, if we took um, all of the numbers and computed a mean across all of the groups, that's called the grand mean, uh, this would be the mean that would be the best estimate of the population mean. So from the perspective of the null hypothesis, that is when your experiment doesn't do anything and you nevertheless measure data in different conditions or groups, the perspective is that these data points, well, they're just coming from the same population. They've all basically got the same mean and they should pretty much all estimate this very same parameter. There's some other things we can think about. The concept of variance. So, um, we expect there to be some within group variation. That is, these dots will be spread about. That's because they're coming from a population with variation in it. 
So the idea is that the variation inside each group, if all of these groups are just, you know, um, different samples of data from the same population, we, sh we expect equal variances. That That is, the variance in A and B and C and D will roughly be the same. They're all approximating the variance of the population. Similarly, we think about between group variation. This is looking at the differences in the means. I've tried to highlight that with the blue here. And, you know, this is actually what we want to see if our experimental manipulation causes a change in the means, we would expect to see these blue lines be different. So that would be evidence that our manipulation worked. It's possible to get different means just by chance because from last semester we learned about the sampling distribution of the mean. And this is a distribution that would be more appropriate to think about for our different levels. We've got four different samples, and the means of these, we would think, would be distributed according to the sampling distribution of the mean. So the kinds of differences we'd expect by chance would be well described by the standard error of the mean, or the standard deviation of this distribution. So yes, according to the null hypothesis, we expect the group means to, on average, be the same as the grand mean but we also know there'll be variation due to sampling error. So we expect those differences will roughly, that between group variation will be like this. It will be distributed like this. It won't be more than this. You'll see stuff that would be within this range. Okay, so what the F ratio is, is just this idea of, let's take these two kinds of variation the within group variation marked by the red lines, that's like how the data is spread about the individual group means. That's an estimate of this thing. And let's, let's put that as, let, let, sorry, let's make a ratio of the variance that we can explain with the group means, that is the differences between the blue lines, how much differences there are there. And D divide by the amount of differences within each group where the little dots are spread about. Um, effectively, if, if we get a lot of variance between the means, of the gut that gets really, really big, we'd expect our F value to get really big. And if these things are approximately the same, that value would be about one. And if your unexplained or variation within your groups is much bigger than the variation between your means, well, your F value will be pretty small. Now, we should recognize that if we just took random numbers out of some population and put them into these groups, every time we do that, we're going to get some different means. We get some different within subject vary or within group variation, and you can calculate an F value. If you if you had some way of measuring the variation between the means and some the average variation and some way of measuring the average variation within each group, you could get a number for this, a number for that, divide them, get an F value. And the thing is, just like the variation between the means is going to change every time because it's a it's random sampling. The variation within the groups is going to change a little bit. So this ratio is just going to change a little bit here and there. So the exact F value you get will be a little bit different. Now, uh, the whole distribution here is called, we call it an F distribution. It's another kind of sampling distribution. It's a sampling distribution of F. And it will look a certain way. And basically, it will look a certain way under the null hypothesis. That is, when there truly are no differences between these groups, we'll get some F distribution. We're going to compute that later to take a look at it. And um, also start thinking about, well, what, what would happen to all these pieces here if there really was differences between the groups? So right now we focused on the null hypothesis that all, all the differences that we're seeing here, all the different kinds of variances, are just normal variance that you get from random sampling. Um, 
the basic idea is that when the differences are not due to random sampling, they're, they're bigger than they ought to be. And so you would get a different kind of F distribution. All right, um, we're gonna try to hone in on some of those ideas throughout the next three weeks. First of all, in this lab, I'm gonna show you how to do the ANOVA by hand using R. Okay, let's walk through this. Um, I'm going to use an example from the textbook. This is an example from Bransford and Johnson's 1972 classic experiment where subjects read a weird paragraph that was hard to understand. And when they didn't see a picture that helped make sense of that paragraph, they had really low comprehension of the paragraph. But when you saw a picture that explained the funny sentences, you did a lot better at remembering and comprehending what was in the paragraph. This is summarized in this table here where we have some example data. And four different context manipulations were used. When people saw the, the picture that makes sense of the paragraph, before they saw the paragraph, everyone had really high comprehension scores. It had a big effect, much higher than all these other conditions. So in this case, it seems like this one group, um, this the, getting the picture context actually did change the comprehension scores. Okay, um, in the textbook, you can see the example scores for five subjects in each group. We're calculating the means, getting the grand mean, calculating a bunch of pieces of the ANOVA, sums of squares total within between um, to create this ANOVA table where we've got the sums of squares, the mean squared error, the F value, and degrees of freedom, and so on. So we're just going to do all of these things in R. The textbook does it for you right here. And uh, let's, yeah, let's do it by, our, in, in, by hand in R. So the first thing we need to do is get those numbers into R. Let's flip over to R here. So I just made a little tibble do this. I put it into long format. So these five numbers, three, three, two, four, three, are the first five numbers in the no context group and so on. So there we've got it. We're gonna do the by hand method a couple different ways so you can get a flavor of some different code for doing this. And um, the first thing we wanna do is calculate the grand mean, right? That's the mean of all of the data. So we could just get the mean of all the scores in the comprehension column and that is 4.35. I'm gonna put that into the grand mean. Just to compare, that's the same value as right here, 4.35. It's the mean of all of these numbers. Now the next thing we wanna do is calculate the total sums of squares. And that is how different each number is from the grand mean, how far off all of the numbers are. I'm gonna use dplyr to do this. And I'm gonna take the data frame. I'm going to make a column called grand mean. And it's just gonna have the grand mean all the way down. It'll look something like this. For every value, I'm just putting the grand mean there. That will make it easy for me to subtract each value from the grand mean, which is what I do in the next steps. So this column subtracts the new grand mean column from the comprehension scores. And then this column just produces the squared values. So if we look at this table, we can see um, all of the numbers that we need. Here's the original data. Here's thinking of the original data in terms of just the grand mean. These are the differences. So the difference between three and 4.35 is 1.35. And 1.8225 is the squared value of this one. So these are all the squared differences. Remember, if we add up just the differences, the deviations, that will add up to zero. So that wouldn't be a very good value to reflect the amount of differences. Um, if we square them, we get, uh, we remove the sign, and this gives us some more weight to the number because it'll add up in terms of a positive number. So, you know, if the data points are all really close to the grand mean, 
then the deviations will tend to be small and the square of those deviations will tend to be small. And if you add them up, you tend to get a small number. The more differences there are between the data points and the grand mean, the more the deviations will be bigger. And if you square them, they'll be bigger. And if you add them up, you'll get a big number. And that big number is called the sum of squares total. So we're just adding up all the squared deviations. And we got 88.55, same as the textbook. Um, there's a 0 .5, 0 0.05 off, but close enough. All right, now let's get the sums of squares between. So what we're going to do here uh, is, first of all, find the group means. So I'm going to do that real quick. We've got a little table here, group means. So the first group is 3, 7, 3.2, 4.2. And that's the same as over here, 3, 7, 3.2, 4.2. Those are the group means. Now, we're going to pull a little trick. We're going to think, let's, can, let's just imagine that every score here is the group mean. So basically, pretend these values are all 3s, and these values are all 7s, and these values are all 3.2s, and so on. So from that perspective, um, how different are the group means from the grand mean? Let's find out. So I put together a few different mutates to add some columns. And I'm just going to quickly show you what I did by looking at the table. So we've got our original scores. We've got a column for the grand mean. I made a new column for the group means because we're treating each score as if it was the group mean. So we've got threes for the first group, sevens for the next group, and so on. For the sum of squares between, we're looking at the deviations between the group means and the grand mean. So 4.35 and 3, that's different by 1.35. That's true for all the values because we're treating all the values as if they're the mean. And so we then uh, square these values and add them up. We're adding up the squared deviations. You know, if your manipulation didn't work, that is, it didn't cause any change in the group means, you would expect all the group means to be the same. And you'd also expect that the group means would be the same as the grand mean. So if the group means and the grand mean were all the same, and you tried to subtract them from one another, what would you get? You should get a bunch of zeros if those things are the same. So if you get a bunch of zeros here, and you add them all up, okay, maybe square a bunch of zeros, you get more zero, and you add them all up, you just get a you, you, you sum up a bunch of nothing, you get zero. This is a way of thinking that if your manipulation does not change the means, they should all be the same. Therefore, the sum of squares here between your means and the grand mean should be small or zero, small or close to zero. The more your means are different, the more they will be different from the grand mean. And the more your sum of squares that adds up those differences will grow. So as your manipulation works, that is causes differences, you will be able to measure a greater sum of squared differences, right? So large sums of squares between indicate potentially your manipulation caused a difference in the mean. All right, to get the actual value, we need to sum up all those differences and we get a uh, 50.95, same as the textbook action. They get a 50.9, but this little 0 .5, 0 0.05 is fine. All right, next, we've got the sum of squares within. So I'm just going to quickly run these lines, and let's take a look at the table that I made. Similar before, we've got our comprehension scores. I've lined up our group means. Now what we're asking is, how different is each score from the group mean? All right. So the first one is not different. It's got a zero. The second one's not different. Another zero. 
this two is off by one. So we've got these deviations between the individual data points and their group means. We could think about these uh, deviations as, you know, not explained by the mean. It's this, it's the part of the data that's not explained by variation between the groups. It's just uh, variation, random variation that exists within each group. So how much of the variation is that? Uh, we can sum it up in terms of those squared deviations and we can get an SS within, there it is. Now the whole point of the ANOVA, which is kind of interesting, is the idea you can partition your variance into a piece that refers to differences between groups and a piece that reflects uh, error or variance that's all already there, that's always going to be there, and that is not affected by the groups. Separate sources of variance. And um, we measured a, the total amount of variance in the data with SS total. Now we're thinking about it as being split into two pieces. One piece that's due to differences in the mean, and one piece that's due to just differences among subjects within each group. And we've uh, gone through three different steps to separately estimate these things. So if this is true, that the total sums of squares equals the sum of the between part and the within part, we should find that these things add up to each other. So we calculated the SS total to be 88.55. The SS between was 50.95, and the SS within was 37.6. And if we add them together, we get 88.55. And if we ask the question, are these two things equal to each other in a logical way, is this value equal to this one, we should get the value true. So yes, our sum of squares between and within add up to the total. Now the rest of the ANOVA table, so we, we just calculated uh, these three things, the sums of squares between, within, and the total. Everything else is just a little bit of algebra. You have to understand that uh, we're going to com compute some, effectively, some variances. We're going to take the SS for the between, and we're going to divide it by the degrees of freedom. And this is like an average. Uh, over here, we're going to take the sums of squares for within and divide it by its degrees of freedom. And it'll be another average. Uh, if you remember the variance formula, this is, we're basically making variances here. So once we do that, uh, the F value is just a ratio of the average between variance and the average within variance. So it's just this one divided by that one over here. So we just need to get the degrees of freedom. And then we already have these SSs. We can get the MSs, so the mean squared error or variances, and divide to get the F ratio. So let's do that real quick. Um, degrees of freedom between, that's four minus one. We had four different groups and we were thinking about, we were estimating the group means with respect to the grand mean. And uh, so we're gonna subtract the one grand mean from our, our uh, oof, I hate talking about degrees of freedom, but it, uh, we're subtracting one because three of those means can be any number they wanna be, but one of them has to be a specific number in order for them all to add up to the grand mean. So it's, it's the appropriate degrees of freedom here would be three. So we could just take our SS between, divide by three to get our MS between, that's 16.98, which is what we see over here. So what about the degrees of freedom for within subjects? Well, there's 20 different subjects in this experiment. And 
when we looked at the within table, so we've got 20 different people here, right? We were estimating these values with uh, four separate group means, one, two, three, four. So of these 20 numbers, 16 of them could be anything they want, but the other four have to be specific numbers in order for these other group means to, to be computed out of this. So we're gonna have 20 minus four degrees of freedom there. And we can divide the SS within by the degrees of freedom to get the average. So that's 2.35, same as the textbook. Now, 16.97 divided by 2.35, that's our F value. So we just have to divide the between by the within. Uh, whoops. Boom. Does this... So our F ratio here, it is 7.22. There it is. All right, so we just did all that by hand in R. Let's speed up things a little bit and do it a different way using a matrix format. This is using the same values. I put them into a matrix. Let's take a look at this. Uh, I, for fun, we'll add the column names. So here we have a data table that looks a lot more like what's in the textbook here looks a lot more like this one. And this is wide format data. Let's look at some operations we can do in R to more quickly compute all the things we need for the ANOVA. Just should, should be able to do this a bit faster, I think. So the first thing we want is sums of squares total, right? So that's uh, the difference between the data points and the grand mean. So the grand mean is just the mean of all the numbers in the matrix. And the difference between the grand mean and all the numbers in the matrix, we can just do like, just like this. So we get a matrix here. These are all the differences. Now what we want to do is, of course, square these differences and then add them up. So this one line gets us the sum of squares total. And we can see it here, 88.55, same thing as before. Sum of squares between, um, well, we want to take the group means. And in this case, that's the column means. And we can use the column means function to get those. From each of these, we subtract the grand mean. And so that will give us Uh, I need one more of these. There, those are the deviations between each mean and the grand mean. We want to square those. All right, and then we want to add them up. Now, notice we're at 10.19 there. I've got a times five, and that's because, remember, we, di we did this for each row in the data. Um, this is only doing it for one of the rows. There's five rows, so let's just, the sum would have to be this same value, 10.19. It would have to be that same value five times over. So that's where we get our 50.95. That's our sum of squares between. Okay, finally, the sum of squares within. Well, that is just, uh, whoops. The means subtracted from the individual data points. R wants you to flip or rotate the matrix for this computation. So let's just quickly do that. Notice the rows have become the columns, but we need to do that here to, com to correctly make the subtraction. So these are the deviations between each of the data points and the group means. We square them and then we add them up. And our SS within, same as before. So in three lines, we just calculated all the things we need for the ANOVA table. I mean, we only really need to do two of these because we can estimate the other one by subtraction. Um, but the, the, the remaining pieces are the same. Once we have our SSs, we can just calculate all these things. Now, here's the fastest way to do it in R. 
use the AOV function. I'm going back to the, or what we are calling the Romeo and Juliet version of the data. This is long format data, the one I made up at the top. And in the ANOVA function, we just pop in the formula. So this will be the name of the column that is the dependent variable, comprehension scores, as a function. So that's the tilde of the name of the column as the independent variable. So that was called group. Then we connect the data to the data frame. The data frame of th this is called Romeo underscore Juliet. So when we run this, we, we produce an AOV object. This is not showing us the ANOVA table. We'll see that one way to do that is to store the results of the ANOVA into a variable and then put the variable containing the ANOVA object into the summary function. And here is the ANOVA table, the same one that we get in the textbook. So that's two ways of doing the ANOVA by hand in R and also just doing all of it with the AOV function, which is a fast way to do the ANOVA. All right, let's turn to the first concept section. Uh, basically, what I wanna do here is focus in on each of the components of the ANOVA table. So if we just look at this, we've got our sums of squares, our mean squared error, and our F value. I think we should be able to get a sense of what these values mean with respect to our experimental question. So, I mean, you know, what would any one of these values tend to look like if the null hypothesis was true? That is, if your experiment doesn't work and it doesn't cause differences in your data, it doesn't cause differences in the means of your groups, what kind of values would you expect to find? Um, if, if we had a good idea about that, then it would, it would give us a sense of the kind of um, things that you just find by random sampling. And if, if you want to make claims that your independent variable is doing something in beyond that, you'd, you'd, you'd want to be able to see what would happen when chance is just mucking about versus what would happen when there's really something going on. So we're going to go through each of these different pieces and try to consider the question, like what would happen to SS total if the null was true? What would happen if it wasn't true? What we're going to do is continue with this uh, very same example data, sort of. So with our example data from the Bransford and Johnson experiment, we were looking at something kind of like this, right? There was four groups and there was five subjects in each group. And we were looking at comprehension scores. Okay, let's uh, be slightly more abstract. Let's just um, think about this design as some, something with four groups and five subjects per group. Okay, so that's our design. And what happens here in this design according to the null hypothesis. Well, according to that, when we, uh, what we're basically doing is just taking random values out of a normal distribution and putting some of them into each of the groups, okay? So let's simulate that process. What I put in here are random values from the normal distribution, 20 random values. There's four columns, five rows. So 20 would be enough. I'm picking a unit normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. This is a convenient one to work with. So there we have it, some random numbers. Okay. This, if we, I think if we keep going here, we could try to get a sense of what's gonna to happen to SS total. So let's compute SS total for our random data. There it is. We got a 15.35, right? So if we basically do this, 
um, c calculate the grand mean, calculate the deviations between each of the random numbers in the grand mean, we will, and add them up, we happen to get 15, whatever, right? Um, so there you go. At, at this point, this isn't very meaningful. It's just some random number that we got. Let's try it again. I mean, if, if we took out, uh, it's uh, five numbers per group is what we're doing out of this random distribution. Um, let's do it again. So if I press play, I've just resampled all the numbers. Now all the numbers here are different. I could recompute SS total. Okay, we got 11.8. Okay, fine. Do it again. Resample the numbers, recompute SS total, get 13.4. Just as an aside, I'll have you wonder in your head about the relation between what we're doing right here, summing up all these deviations, and the chi-square distribution. Not See if you can think about what the relationship is. All right, back to the SS total. We are now watching what happened to the SS total for three different replications of a Null hypothesis. Here's another one. So it, it takes on these values. It's just the sum of these squared deviations. Let's get a better sense of what that looks like. Let's do this whole thing a thousand times. So we'll run a little Monte Carlo simulation. Every time I'm going to re-randomize the data, I'm going to calculate SS total, and I'm going to save it in this variable. Okay, And then we're going to look at a histogram. So this is a sampling distribution of SS total for this design. When you have four groups and five people in each group, um, you'd expect SS totals that look like this if you're sampling from a unit normal distribution. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm seeing that they don't really get much larger than 50. They're kind of in around this, you know, so far, I, I don't have much to disagree with. Apparently this is what it looks like. Let's consider, um, I was, sorry, go back to here. Let's consider the question. Well, what would this look like if my experiment worked? See right now, Nothing's happening. All, all the numbers in each of the groups are being sampled from the very same distribution. So like, yeah, they'll be different, but only by chance alone. Random sampling errors causing those differences. So what if I forced a difference? What if I assume that my experiment did work and that one of the groups is gonna have a different mean? It's basically gonna be, the numbers in that group are gonna be coming from a different place, a different distribution. How can we, how, how can we uh, think about doing that? Let's consider that right here. I'm gonna call this an alternative distribution. Now we, we could think about lots of ways that our manipulation could cause some difference. For the sake of just doing something simple, here we have uh, simulated random data, just like before. Now I'm gonna assume that group one, these are, again, these just random numbers. Let's imagine that um, the manipulation causes the numbers in group one to be shifted two whole standard deviations, all right? Well, we're sampling numbers from a unit normal where the standard deviation is one. I'm saying I want the numbers in the first column, and we can use our square notation to identify the first column. I'm saying those ones should be shifted up by two because that's what the manipulation does. It consistently shifts the data up by two. That's a pretty big shift. It would be a huge effect really. So let's do that. I'm taking the values that were there and I added two to all of them. So you can see they're, they're bigger than they were before. So I want you to appreciate that in this case, the simulated data 
is not the null hypothesis. One of the groups is coming from a normal distribution with a mean of two and a standard deviation of one. The other three groups are coming from this one here, with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So now one of the groups really is different. Great. What's this going to do to the sum of squares total? That's the question that we're trying to answer here. Well, let's just simulate this, see what happens. Boom. Okay, so these are the sum of squares totals that we get in this one situation. It'd be easier to compare them. So what I've done here is made a little ggplot where we can see them both at the same time. Under the null hypothesis, all the data points are coming from the same distribution. And if we put them into four different groups and calculate the grand mean and sum up the squared differences to the grand mean, we'll get a distribution like we'd expect the, that number to follow the, the greeny distribution. That's the sum of squares total for, for this situation. In the other situation, we made three of the groups come from that one distribution, and one of the groups come from a, a distribution with a mean of two, so it's like a huge shift. Notice that the distribution of sum of squares total you would get in that situation is very different looking. It's shifted out. In other words, if you think about sum of squares total as a number that represents all of the little bits of differences between the numbers and the grand mean, a sum of those, um, you'd expect some amount, the green distribution amount, when the group manipulation does nothing, but when your manipulation does something, notice it tends to increase the total amount of sums of squares. That is, when your manipulation works, it causes differences. It introduces differences to your data. More differences than you would expect to be there by chance alone. Let's move on to the sum of squares between. We're going to basically do the same thing here. Um, I'm going to move a little faster. So, uh, sum of squares between. Um, it's the same as what we did before, it's just that here we're going to calculate the sum of squares between instead of sum of squares total. So we're going to sand it, sample random numbers from assuming the null, um, calculate the sum of squares between, and save it. So this is a distribution, a sampling distribution of the sum of squares between that we'd expect to get under the null hypothesis. And then we're going to make another one where we introduce that effect. So we're saying group one really does do something different, and it has a mean shift of two. We're going to get another distribution for this alternative hypothesis. And then we're going to plot them both together. So you can see that the green distribution, that's the distribution you'd expect, that is the uh, sum of squares is between is the uh, amount of differences between the group means and the grand mean. So even though those should be the same, they're both estimating the same thing, yeah, you get some differences because I mean, if you think about it, the, the grand mean includes all of the data. So it's a less variable estimate of the population mean. The group means have l fewer subjects in them. So even though they're estimating the same population mean, they'll do a worse job of it. There'll be more variability inherently because the sample size is smaller. So if you subtract a um, more precise number from a variable number, you'll, you'll tend to get a bit of differences. And if you square them and add them up, you, there always will be some differences there, the differences you'd expect by chance. And that's what this green distribution is. However, 
look what happens again to the alternative. And this is just one of the alternatives. It's when group one has a big effect. Um, here, group one will basically, it will always be different than the grand mean, won't it? Because it's so much different. We've, we've added to, uh, if the grand mean is, um, on average supposed to be zero, well, that group will be way different every time. So that will tend to increase the sum of squares between, because this one mean will always be different from the grand mean. And it um, would look like this. Notice like you could get a sum of squares between, that's like a 30, if you really did have a difference in there. And your null hypothesis will never do that. Um, so this, if you got a 30, you could be pretty confident that this null hypothesis wasn't wasn't causing that difference. Now let's think about the sum of squares within now. Okay, do the same thing. We're going to create simulated data from our null distribution. So sampling numbers, 20 numbers, same distribution to all the four different groups. And now we're gonna calculate the sum of squares within. This is the difference between each group mean and the data points inside of that group. Um, that's the red parts here. All right, we do that for the null hypothesis, and let's do that again for the alternative hypothesis we're considering here. Now, consider this. We are only adding a two to the values in group one. This is like saying group one has a shift of the mean by two. We are not changing anything about the variation in that group. So the variation within the group really is assumed to be the same across groups. Um, if we look at this number, it's a standard deviation of one in the null hypothesis, and it's a standard deviation of one in the alternative hypothesis. We're assuming equal variances. So if we run both of these simulations and plot the data, what we're seeing is that these distributions should be the same under both of these uh, potential situations where the null is true or the alternative is true. Now, granted, we're talking about a specific kind of alternative hypothesis here, one that specifically says that the only thing your manipulation does do is change a mean. It's possible that your manipulation could change a variance, and uh, this analysis wouldn't be appropriate, really, for finding out if that was true. Okay, finally, or not finally, I guess we got a few more to go here. We could think about the mean squared between. So the question again is, what would your mean squared between look like if your manipulation didn't work? And what would it look like if it did? Remember, this value is simply the sum of squares between divided by the degrees of freedom. So we could take our sum of squares distribution that we already made and just divide by three, and we'd have a distribution of mean squared errors for the between group situation. You can look at that. And what we're seeing is basically what we saw for the sum of squares here. It's just that the values are um, averages and uh, not sums. And yeah, again, we're, we're gonna get larger mean squared betweens when there really is a difference compared to the null when we'll get some differences here, but that's just due to sampling error. When we look at the mean squared within, we're going to divide by, we're just going to take the sum of squared within distributions we made, divide by 16, which is the number of, um, which is the degrees of freedom in this situation. And now we're looking at these averages and we can see that these two distributions shouldn't be different 
even if the null hypothesis isn't true, because we're assuming equal variances. All right, the last thing is the F distribution. And remember, that's just a, uh, if we look back up here, that is a ratio of the between variance and the within variance. So, you know, on average, your means will be a little different. And on average, your data points will be a little different even when the null hypothesis is true. That's because of random sampling error. And if you get a number that tells you how much your means are different and how much your data points are different within each group, and you divide them, the, one, the number on the top is gonna go up and down a bit, the number on the bottom is gonna go up and down a bit. By how much? Well, we just looked at that for our situation, didn't we? The number on the top, it's gonna go up and down a bit by this, um, green distribution, the number on the bottom is going to go up and down a bit by, the num by this number here in the green distribution. So what should your F value look like? If it's just a one number, it's one of these numbers divided by one of these numbers. Let, let's just think about that for a second. So, okay, fine. I'm just going to get some number out of this distribution. Let's say it's this one right here. Um, how about this one? What is that? That's like a 2.5. So let's say you got a 2.5 for the top and you go down here and you're like, oh, I got this one. Oh, that's really close to a one. You know, these are things that would happen pretty frequently. So you got a 2.5 on the top and a one on the bottom. So what's your F? 2.5 divided by one, 2.5. You get an F of 2.5 probably. Probably happens quite a bit. I mean, let's think about what would happen really a lot. Um, this number looks like you'd get this one a lot. What's that? Um, one, two, this is something that's close, close to a one probably. Probably get a one a lot for the MS between on the top. Oh, it looks like here you'd get a one a lot for the denominator. So probably a lot of times in this case, your F value is gonna be kind of close to one. But you know, the numbers on the top and the bottom could be a bit different. So you're gonna, you're gonna have different F values. They'll all be positive because both of these values will only ever be positive. So let's go and do it. Let's just look at the F distribution. Um, what I'm going to do is run the simulations over. So I'm going to do a thousand of them. This is sampling from the null hypothesis, assuming that all the data for all the groups is the same, that it's coming from the same distribution. I'm going to calculate SS between. I'm going to calculate SS within for each time I simulate the data. And then I'm going to calculate the F value for each simulation. And then I'm going to save the F value. So we can see what the F value looks like according to the null hypothesis. I'm also going to do that for our one uh, alternative here where we've added in a, an effect of two to the first group. So in this case, remember, the mean squared between is going to typically be a lot larger. So we'd be thinking about this red distribution. So it's, it's probably going to be a six. You know, that's what happens the most here. So your F here could be a six divided by a one-ish. A six, you might get a six. That might be pretty common for an F value of this alternative. All right, let's do it. So we got our two distributions. Let's plot them and take a look. So our green distribution, that's our null hypothesis. That's the F values you would get when there are no differences for real. Every, all the differences are just random. Uh, looks like the most common F value here is kind of close to a one. And look for the alternative, you know, getting much larger F values. You're getting F values that you would never get by chance. And uh, I think it's this one is probably the most common kind of F value. It's around a five-ish. All right, so that's some um, 
simulation work that we did, the point of it was to think about what each of the values, the sums of squares, the mean squared, errors, the f value, what they ought to look like according to the null hypothesis, what they ought to look like if the null hypothesis isn't true. And there's a, actually a difference in the means be between the levels. Um, one one th reason I think this is helpful is to understand the F distribution. For example, when we look at this table, the ANOVA table, almost all of these values are uh, effectively descriptive statistics of the data. We compute all of these things directly from the, the data. And the thing that we don't compute from the data is this number here, the p-value, the probability of obtaining this f-value under the null hypothesis, which is specifically related to an f-distribution with a numerator degrees of freedom of three, and a denominator of 16. So what is an F distribution? Um, we're gonna get into that. Part of, uh, not so much today, but what we just went through should help you develop some intuitions about this. For example, we just simulated an F distribution, didn't we? And we're gonna do it again momentarily. So the question is, where did the p-value come from? Let's think about that. Um, first of all, the p-value from the AOV function that uh, also gives us 0 0.00278. And that was calculated from an F distribution with three degrees of freedom, the numerator and 16 in the denominator. You'll find that there is an F distribution function in R. And just like the other ones like um, R norm and the, the T distribution, we've got an F distribution. And we can use the PF function to um, look at the probability of getting a 7.227 or larger, which is the F value we found from the Bransford and Johnson example at the beginning. This is the degrees of freedom. Um, so that uh, F value in this table, it came from an F distribution right here. So this is one way you could find that P value. But my question is, where did the F distribution come from? I mean, if you wanted to do take a look at the F distribution, you could say, well, let's take some a thousand numbers from the F distribution and use the degrees of freedom three and 16. So there's the S, there's an F distribution. And you can change the degrees of freedom and you'll notice that the F distribution changes depending on the degrees of freedom and all this stuff. I wanna give you a concept behind this distribution. We, we, we basically just went over that when we talked about this section here and generated this simulation of f of f values but we do that one more time so i'm jumping around a bit here's what we're going to do we're going to take the romeo and juliet data frame which currently looks like this right these are the numbers from that example and what we did in that example was we computed f and we found 7.22 and we're seeing here that, that the probability of getting that or larger is 0 0.00288. Okay, fine. Let's play a little game. What we're going to do is replace the example data, that is the scores in the comprehension column, with 20 random numbers from a normal distribution. Okay, let's do it kind of blending what we're doing before a little bit. So uh, these numbers are not the example numbers, they're just some random numbers from a normal distribution in there. Oops, accidentally deleted, or just, I need to get this back, sorry about this. All right, so 
if we wanted to do an ANOVA on these random numbers, we could. I just did it. And if we wanted to get the F value, we could do that too. So here it is. For these random numbers, I just got an F value of 0.289. All right. I'm going to put that into simulated F. So I'm just showing you that I can make up random numbers from a normal distribution, put them into this data frame, run an ANOVA, and calculate an F value. It's a little bit like what we did before. It's just an F value you would get in this situation if all of your numbers are coming from a normal distribution. And you have four groups and five people per group. This is an F value we got from the null hypothesis. All right. I want to get a sense of the kinds of F values I could get by chance. So I'm, I'm not interested in just this one F value where it was 0.289. I'm, you know, could I get a 7.22? That's the one that we found in the example data. I mean, probably not. If the probability is 0.02 or whatever, pretty low probability. Anyways, let's get a hundred different F values. So I'm gonna make a vector, There's a, make room for a hundred things in it. I'm gonna do this above process a hundred times. Every time sample new random numbers into the comprehension column, run the ANOVA, get the F value out and save it. So there's, um, these are a hundred F values that I could have got just by chance. Let's look at it. Here we, we see a simulated distribution of F values. This is a sampling distribution um, of F values. Now what I want to know, I mean, I could use this distribution, I think, to compute the probability of getting an F value larger than 7.22, which is the F value we got right here. So let's do that. I get a zero here. I mean, in, in inside of the hundred times I did this, n none of the values were larger than 7.22. So zero divided by the hundred times I did this, I just get zero. I didn't do enough simulations to find this kind of rare event. So, I mean, 0 0.00288. That's pretty small, uh, but it should happen, you know, once or twice out of 10,000. So let's do this whole thing 10,000 times. Let's simulate 10,000 F values. See basically what would happen to the F value if you repeated the experiment 10,000 times. It takes a little bit longer. We're gonna get our 10,000 F values. We can look at the distribution and you can see already that the x-axis goes out to 14, right? So just by chance alone, you can get some pretty big F values. Looks like there's a seven. So what's the probability of getting a 7.22 or more? 0 0.0021. It's pretty close to this value here. So what we just did was try to connect where this F distribution is coming from. It's really just the idea of what would happen to F if the data was coming from a normal distribution, a single normal distribution, um, and that all the groups were ineffectual. They just didn't do anything. So you'd get these F values and some of them, you know, you get a distribution of F values. What we found is that in this case, 7.22 doesn't happen very often by chance. So we reject the null hypothesis. All right, we're almost done. We're heading on to the second practical section. I'm going to show you some quick things to do with the AOV function. We'll see a lot more of this for the rest of the semester. We're just going to go back to the Romeo and Juliet example. 
the same data we've been using. So the first thing I'm going to do is run this to restore the comprehension data so it's not random numbers anymore. And say some stuff about the AOV function. This is a bit redundant with what I already said. We're going to use the AOV function. We're going to connect it to the data that is uh, that has the data frame for our data. <laughs> the data has to be formatted in long format. We're going to use our formula here. The dependent variable goes on the left side of the tilde. The independent variable goes on the right. These are the names of the columns. We run this and we produce the ANOVA object. I've saved it in a variable here. You can name this whatever you want. I saved it as ANOVA.OUT. And if you want to look at this, you can see it's a list of 13 things. There's a ton of stuff in here. This is all the background work that I was doing for you. Saving the um, statistical model in a list object. If you just print out the contents of this, then you get something that looks like this. It shows you the formula, but it doesn't give you the ANOVA table. If you want the ANOVA table, you put the ANOVA object into the summary function, and that will get you the ANOVA table. This is pretty common strategy in R. There's going to be some function like AOV or LM that will produce a, a model object, which is usually a bunch of lists like this. And there's a, a sort of accepted way of defining these things. If you put them in the summary function, if they've been written properly, then the summary function will return a useful summary for the model. In the ANOVA case, it returns the ANOVA table. You could uh, do this too if you wanted. Just this thing creates the ANOVA object. You could just put that right into the summary function and you'd get the summary table. Another function that's like summary is model.tables. If you put the ANOVA object into this, then what you get is the means of the groups. Sometimes you might want to know that. Now, just look at the ANOVA table. There's lots of stuff in here, right? You might want to access individual numbers for different reasons. Here's how you could do that. Let's go and here we're going to take the ANOVA object, run the summary function, but save that into another variable. So there's that variable. If we look at it, it's a list. It's got some stuff in it. It's got all of our degrees of freedoms and stuff like that. And I'll just show you. If I type my summary, and if I put a dollar sign, unfortunately, we can't see the contents because they're inside of a list. So we need to index into that list, put a one here, two, two square brackets. Now when we put a dollar sign, we can see the things that are inside. So if you want the F value, there you go. And here's an example of getting each of those different things. The degrees of freedom, sums of squares, mean squared, F value, and the P value. Now, you could use this strategy to help you insert specific values into your R Markdown document if you wanted. I'm going to show you some quick things to do with PapaJaw. It'll help you report your statistics. So let's load the PapaJaw library. PapaJaw has this great function called APA print. And if you put an ANOVA object inside of here, guess what happens? It gives you a bunch of options. These are things you can print out in your document if you wanted to. So I want to print out the, the F. Uh, that I want to print out the ANOVA main effect for group here. Typically, the way you do that, at least and in terms of APA style right now, that's going to be in the letter F, the degrees of freedom between and within, the F value, the mean squared error within, the P value to three decimal places, and potentially 
a measure of effect size. And APA print has created exactly what you might want to write down. So um, if we just take that one piece, so remember there's a bunch of different things here, but we want full results, dollar sign, full result, dollar sign group. So this one is this the statement we want. If I take that and put it into my document, just like this, and I'm going to expand this, it might be a bit easier to see. I'm inserting this into an inline code snippet using the back ticks, starting with the letter R, means that this will get executed as R code and printed to the document. So this statement contains all of this, um, all the dollar signs and stuff like that. This is for printing to LaTeX, which helps uh, format these things in terms of math symbols. So you can see what I've written here and if you go to the website and you can see what was printed to the website, it actually prints out the ANOVA result just like that. Finally, APA print also contains things like the ANOVA table. And there is a handy function called APA underscore table that will take table uh, tables as an input and output them in APA style. So you get something that looks something like this. All right, that's, that's it for the first lab on ANOVA. Uh, wow, I think this went longer than I anticipated. I'm going to try to make the next one shorter. See you next week.